Ah, it's always on. Yeah, <laughs> now it's working. Yeah, yeah, it's always on. Okay, uh, now Professor Ziboide from Harvard University will start his lecture series on uh, stringy aspects of gravitational scattering. That should work. So it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my third time in Trieste. The first time I came as a student for this, exactly this uh, school. But um, the only thing I remember is uh, the name and the face of my roommates from the school. So everything else I forgot. Um, so the, my, lectures, uh, uh, my lectures have two parts, and uh, they're quite separated. Uh, so I will, I will be talking about uh, gravitational scattering and several aspects of it. And uh, so the first part will deal with uh, uh, IR. Yes, and please uh, ask me, uh, stop me, uh, we will, because I, I planned a lot of material. But we better not go there if it's uh, you just it's completely un un understandable. So. Um, the first part is uh, IR, and uh, by IR we mean uh, so low energies and uh, uh, say late time, large times. And uh, the second part is uh, deals with the UV, so to say. So it's uh, high energies. And uh, they are quite, quite disconnected, as you can imagine, even though maybe they are, in reality, less disconnected than they seem. Um, so today, I will obviously start with uh, the first part. So let me just erase that. And uh, uh, the useful, before I start, maybe just me write a useful reference is, uh, um, to this part is, uh, it's a course taught by, by Andy Streminger in recently, and uh, as a video, the videos are recorded. So you can watch uh, if you, there are like 10 or 22 hour lectures. So if you're interested, just look at it. Um, okay. Uh, in, so in the low energies, we, of course, expect the gravitational theories even if we think of gravitational theory as being some um, uh, effective theory with high derivative corrections, at large distances and low energies, it uh, reduces to Einstein theory. And uh, uh, the usually uh, or one way to introduce this topic is to draw, or, or for some reason it is drawn as a triangle. So let me erase it which uh, represents uh, the plan of the lecture. So what is this triangle? So triangle, let me draw it like that. Um, so each of the vertex uh, corresponds to a set of ideas. And uh, actually, each of these ideas uh, is very old. Uh, so if, uh, let, I'll try to write a little bit larger. So one. Uh, uh, one uh, angle is uh, soft theorems. Second is memory effect, memories, and third in asymptotic symmetries. These are three recurring topics. In a, so, if you consider scattering in flat space, that's what I will be mostly interested in. Uh, these are three things which are usually discussed, though, in uh, different uh, in different subjects and different. There are different areas of physics. So uh, soft theorems, they deal, uh, and here it's, the subject is very old. So the, the, the reference would be 64th paper by Weinberg. Um, so soft theorem uh, deals with uh, low energy limit of scattering amplitude. So if you have some scattering process and you take uh, uh, one of the particles momentum uh, energy of, let me write it, energy of the particle goes to zero. This describes the soft limit of the amplitude. And you can, so Weinberg found is that these limits are 
uh, universal, and uh, that's known as the soft theorems. Um, then uh, uh, the second corner is, uh, say, asymptotic symmetries, and it's uh, in the case of uh, uh, flat space, again, it's a very old subject. It uh, comes from uh, 1962 in the works of Bondi, uh, Van der Burg, Metzner, and Sachs. And uh, as we will discuss also in, in, de in details, asymptotic symmetries are the symmetries uh, which will be relevant to consider for scattering problem. Uh, but um, so the maybe more uh, formal definition, you, you, can, uh, you can write that asymptotic symmetry group will be set of uh, in gravity allowed. And we will discuss what it means, allowed diffeomorphisms over trivial diffeomorphisms. And this is, a, you can think, you should think about, you can think about it as a um, so large gauge transformation, let's say. How they are called also usually in the literature. And um, so, and the third, uh, the third uh, corner is, uh, say, memory effect. Here the relevant paper will be uh, from 1974, by at least in the, in the gravity context, by Zildovich and Polnareff, and uh, this describe this describes uh, uh, residual deformation of uh, of a gravitational detector. Actually, residual. I will also discuss in deta detail residual deformation of a gravitational detector. So now, uh, these uh, three subjects, uh, a little bit, the, actually, they were very old, and they were pretty separated. So, so theorems, uh, mostly a particle physicist are aware of this, uh, but it's sort of less known in, in the other branches, and. Uh, Asymptotic symmetries is a subject and the questions which uh, people who are doing mathematical relativity uh, are doing. And uh, memory effects, uh, people who are doing astronomy and uh, astrophysics and gravitation, study gravitational waves, um, they, they would know about this one. But uh, so let me write it astro. But uh, until very recently, the, this uh, very old subjects, which are 50 years old, were developing sort of separately. And the recent development uh, was that they actually all the same thing in disguise. And uh, the, the, the driving uh, force, I would say, of this re recent uh, developments uh, were uh, this uh, rich interplay that if you have, a, if you're an astrophysicist, you think about detecting gravity waves and it gives you one insight. If you're a particle physicist, you have a completely different picture. If you're a mathematical relativist, you have a third one. And the power of this uh, recent development uh, was uh, to this interplay, which was uh, constantly driving. You, you know something on one side, you translate what it means on the other side. And in this way, many things, new, new things on, in each angle were discovered. Uh, but why, why would you say, you can ask why, so why, uh, uh, um, why, why would we study this old, uh, old material? It's already 50 years old, and how did people uh, come about this, uh, these things? And um, my picture is that, that uh, there are so basically two major steps, is that, well, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the big question, if you want a big question in this field, is uh, always uh, well, this, say, flat space, flat space holography. We would like to understand. Um, uh, we would like to, to get to have something like ADS-CFT, where we have a non-perturbative formulation of you know, observables in asymptotically flat space times. What is the S matrix? Uh, but uh, at the moment, it's. Uh, would say that the project is very far from that, um, and it was uh, uh, the stage of let's understand the basics of this, uh, this problem. 
And uh, the excitement, the recent excitement come uh, from uh, first, uh, there was a paper on 2009 by Barnish and Troissa, who discover sort of Virasora symmetry in the sky. Virasora, well, let me call it in the sky. I don't know if it means much, but. But basically, they, 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 re, they made this analysis of asymptotic symmetries old, and they found that similar, uh, like in the, in the stories from the 70s, which we just uh, just was mentioned in the previous lecture, that you can extend the group of asymptotic symmetries, extend the group of uh, global conformal transformation in the sphere to the local ones, and then the question was, they call it super rotations. This is, um, I'll again talk about it in details. Um, And uh, so it was uh, very suggestive. What does it mean? Do we have a two-dimensional CFT? And uh, people, uh, my impression, got a little bit excited and were trying to understand uh, what it means. Uh, and then the, the really is a flood. Uh, well, the, it opened in 2013 uh, when the, uh, in the paper by Strominger. who sort of uh, was able to uh, understand uh, at least two, uh, two points of the corner. And then if I told you that this, all the same things are the same, so you should draw the connection between those. So he, he was able to understand, to know enough about this mathematical relativity and particle physics at the same time to understand what is the relation. And he uh, explained that uh, these two things uh, um, the same, and uh, if you wish, this is a word, the soft theorem is a word identity of this, um, of this asymptotic symmetry. Then it was, uh, it was understood that uh, if you think uh, of this kind of residual, uh, residual deformations which people discuss in astrophysics, they also naturally appear in this uh, asymptotic symmetries as a uh, well, sometimes it's called uh, vacuum transitions, even though it probably causes more confusion than it, it helps. But let me just uh, let me just follow the literature uh, so people understand the, the connection between asymptotic symmetries and memories. And memory, as I told you, it's a residual uh, deformation of the detector, it's the response of the detector at large times, and soft theorems. It's a, it's a um, so it's low energy, it's large time, and as you can imagine, uh, that uh, low energy and large times are related by a Fourier transform. So this, these two things were kind of Fourier of each other. Not exactly, but. Sorry, yes, so. Um, Yes, I have to, I guess, explain residual. Let me explain it here. So if you have a gravitational detector, it's just, say, two particles uh, moving on the geodesics. And then uh, when the gravitational wave comes, uh, they start to oscillate. So the, the distance between them, say, changes. And then the gravitational wave is gone. And uh, there can be a residual effect that they, the distance, say, between them is... Uh, is different from the, the original one. So residual it is in a sense, and uh, when we have a, some gra gravitational wave, and then uh, the radiation comes, and the radiation is gone, and we're again sort of in the vacuum. And this is exactly, so in, in this wording, this vacuum is, it doesn't refer to a you know, vacuum of quantum field theory, because if we, st uh, yeah. but it's a statement about uh, the, the, the radiation modes are not excited. And so the transition between one state without radiation to another state, uh, well, people who study gravity waves, they knew that there are sources of gravity waves, uh, well, actually generic sources, for example, the one by LIGO, uh, would uh, lead to such an effect that there is a deformation, residual deformation, from the original state of an antenna to the different one. So it's very, in this case, say, LIGO is sensitive at around 100 hertz. But this is a very low energy effect, so that's why it's with Earth-based interferometry, you cannot 
quite um, uh, measure that. But uh, so now, uh, basically, after this paper came out, uh, since uh, end of 2013, there are around 200 papers on the subject. And uh, if you have this, uh, this, this, all these papers, you can you can sort of. I wanted to do this uh, review. Um, you can first uh, you can sort them by first choosing. Um, so in which uh, say which corner are we in? You can write a paper on uh, either soft theorem or asymptotic symmetry on the memory. Then uh, uh, you can choose. Uh, which theory you would like to consider, because the, even though I'm talking about gravity, just uh, for, for no fundamental reason, you can, you can talk about uh, gravity, you can talk about QED, which is an even older subject. You can, I don't know, talk about supersymmetry. So you can choose your theory. So after you choose your corner and your theory, you can choose uh, uh, so if we have a small parameter or a large parameter, we can expand in this parameter. And so there is what is called leading and subleading and sub sub subleading, etc. So theorems and the same uh, translates uh, translates to all other corners. You found the soft theorem. You question what is the asymptotic symmetry that corresponds to it. You found an asymptotic symmetry. What is the soft theorem? What are the memories? So you can travel around. Well, and of course, say uh, the number of dimensions also. Say you can choose the number of dimensions, which uh, in some corners uh, you feel that number of dimensions is completely irrelevant. For example, if you're a particle physicist, you know that uh, you know that there are soft theorems uh, in any number of dimensions. But if you're a mathematical relativist, you would find it very confusing because say people thought that there is no BMS symmetry in D larger than four. Et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, basically you can sort all the papers written on the subject uh, in uh, in this uh, in this in this way. Um, and uh, so this is a this is a picture that's supposed to cover this uh, broadly this field. And I will focus on gravity in 4D in my lectures and try to explain. Uh, uh, in d equal to four, um, uh, the story in more details there. But please ask me questions now. If, if yeah. So let's say uh, we take. Uh, uh, so we can take uh, d equals seven. We take a gravity, and then you can ask, okay, so what can we say about gravitational scattering in seven dimensions? Uh, you can ask. Uh, you can study scattering amplitude, so you can study the asymptotic structure of field at null infinity, um, and then, uh, depending on d, it happens that these uh, questions depend. They depend on d, and they depend on the theory. Uh, but in principle. Yeah, and then you proceed to which order, because say to leading order everything is known, the subleading order, and of course also there is a there is a e which I sort of important e which I forgot, which is a classical versus quantum. So you can start study loop corrections and uh, what happens, uh, how to think about that. Uh, one thing also is I want to maybe say from the beginning that. Uh, I don't want to present the subject as something which is already written in stone, that it's, everything is clear. I, I think that many aspects are pretty confusing. And um, probably in a few years, it will be a better way to, uh, to think about it. And uh, so I chose my way through and uh, tried to explain the ideas. But probably there is a, maybe there is a better way or it's uh, developing quite quite rapidly. Um, so any, any questions with uh, this picture on these corners? OK, so now if you have this picture, you will already uh, pretty far. 
uh, because we at least will now just discuss what exactly is asymptotic symmetry, what is a memory, uh, etc. And uh, I would start uh, with gravity in four dimensions. I would uh, follow several steps. And um, these steps will be of increasing complexity because, well, so that uh, we can slowly understand uh, what's going on. Is it, can I read here or is it fine? Oh, I, let me try. So let me discuss uh, gravity waves uh, in flat space. Okay, so let me remind you what, uh, how the Lagrangian and Feinstein theory look. Uh, we have uh, curvature plus potentially corrections, matter and some high derivative corrections, which I will not be care about because they're all, uh, uh, they're all irrelevant. In particular, as I will discuss a little bit, you can consider theories which are gravity. You know, when I mean gravity, you can also add high derivative corrections, etc. But the nice thing about this IR part that is pretty universal and things which I will be talking about, they're pretty insensitive. You can add any high derivative corrections you like. It doesn't change the story. Um, the equations of motions, of course, take the well-known form, where T mu stands for the stress tensor. And now uh, to uh, discuss these effects, let's uh, consider a very simple example. Um, is, uh, we consider a flat space plus uh, some little perturbation, small perturbation, and well, uh, there is some reference frame where it's small, so it's enough. And now we can, uh, yes, also the, I will be working in this lecture uh, in a signature minus plus plus. Okay, um, so if we consider this kind of uh, perturbation, because uh, as, as you know, that, that uh, for due to dif different variants, we have a gauge symmetry, and uh, the, the field equations would be, uh, there, is a, there is a redundancy in the description of the space-time of the type So we can, uh, as, as a standard uh, step, we can uh, fix a gauge, which is, uh, has many names. Uh, Lorentz, the Donder, Harmonic, I believe they're all the same. Uh, so let me fix the gauge. And then uh, uh, there is a residual, uh, so that's a gauge condition. Uh, there is a residual symmetry, uh, which again you can you can shift, you can make some diffeomorphisms with a vector field that Laplacian of it is zero, and uh, eliminate uh, four more components, and in this way we can uh, end up describing what is called transverse traceless gauge, where h zero mu so would be zero. Trace will be zero. So it's uh, very simple. And j, j, j will be zero. And uh, the equations for, if we plug to the Einstein equations in the vacuum, we will find simply that box HTT, HIJ is equal to zero. So we start with a, if we start in four dimensions, we have 10 components. This eliminates four, this eliminates four more. So this uh, indices i and j is that, uh, well, they transverse. So if you choose the direction of propagation of the wave, we have two components, and this corresponds to the fact that graviton has helicity too. We have two components of the gravity waves. Now, um, that's you all know, probably. Uh, now, what, uh, how, do we, how do we measure what is a gravitational wave detector. So, so gravity
gravity wave. Well, gravity wave detector would be uh, uh, simply, as I mentioned there, we have a pair of uh, particles, uh, say each of them follows the geodesic. So if this is a, um, if this is a massive particle, we characterize it by four velocity. Yes norm equal minus one, and the geodesic equation is m over d tau plus gamma new rho, new rho equal to zero. So I hope this is also familiar. Now uh, when the, uh, uh, if uh, say, I don't know, we study uh, this memory thing or just in general, we're talking about uh, response, uh, we're talking about LIGO, that's what we, have, we have just particles that follow geodesic, which are given by these equations, uh, where this capital gamma Christoffel symbols for the, for the metric. Now, uh, questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. So in flat space, uh, is flat space is gamma size zero. Particles are just say stay at rest, and then when the gravitational wave comes, as we will now discuss, the, the distance changes. That's how we we know that uh, uh, we know that uh, there is a gravity wave. Also, if you uh, um, if we have some uh, space time and uh, uh, this notion of dist this is the notion of a distance between detector or uh, synchronization of their clocks is, uh, is coordinate independent because you can see it here and they, they can exchange signals and say each other, I observe this time and uh, I'm here and then by measuring time it takes light, they can measure the distance. So they communicate via exchanges, but um, so if it's, it's not very important now. Uh, okay, so now let's consider the solution uh, to the, to the correction to the metric due to the pre presence of the gravitational wave. And that's uh, very simple. Uh, so I, cho I chose this coordinates. Uh, which Uh, the following, so u and v are just, uh, u is t minus x3, v is t plus x3, and z are uh, coordinates in the transverse space. And uh, because uh, the gravity wave is just a function of retarded time, this is a solution of Einstein equations to the first order. And uh, then the, Yeah, that's right. That's right. The wave travels in x3 di directions. And uh, well, as an exercise, you can check that uh, if, uh, if a particle stays at the fixed position, zero, say, and z bar, zero, this is, uh, if, you, if, you take, uh, if you take this metric, you compute uh, Christoffel symbols, you find the mo mo ge ge geodesic motion in space-time. You can check that uh, z and z bar is uh, the um, solve the geodesic equation. Now imagine that we start with two particles which are separated by some distance in a, um, uh, in a, in a in the z plane uh, by some distance delta z. So there is a distance uh, delta z and uh, delta z and delta z bar. Now, uh, as I just told you that uh, this, uh, this uh, separation in coordinate z, it's uh, solved geodesic equation for any time. But as, uh, 
But as time, as time progresses, the metric changes. And in particular, we can consider uh, this function h, something uh, which uh, maybe starts from zero, nothing comes. Then there is some gravity wave. And then it, uh, you know, there is a ring down. And then there is a, some residual transformation. You can consider such. And this is time. Now, as, uh, um, as uh, h changes, uh, the distance between two particles changes. And this can be seen that uh, by just evaluating the, if you take two points at the same time and the same uh, uh, position x3 and uh, evaluate, uh, use the metric to compute the distance, we find that the L of u is uh, L0, say, square, plus this effect of the wave, delta, um, say delta z square plus h z bar z bar delta z bar square. Now, uh, this, uh, this is called gravitational strain. And so for the, again, just uh, as a warm up for the LIGO event, this is 10 to the minus 21 maximal peak. So it's pretty small usually. You have to, that's why you have to have very sensitive uh, detector. But now notice that uh, if we say, if we, this function of h of u can be arbitrary here. In particular, we can, we can choose uh, uh, the, um, the original and the final value to be different. In this way, the gravitational wave comes. The distance oscillates. And then after uh, the gravitational wave uh, past, uh, we had uh, some residual deformation. This residual deformation of gravitational detector is called memory. So that's a simple, yeah. Yeah, it's a distance, it's a distance between two detectors. So we have a space time with a fixed metric and we have two positions of the detector. So we, for example, I send a, uh, moreover, as uh, I will discuss, it's a flat space, so we're just in Minkowski space. Yeah. We use perturbed metric. We use perturbed metric, yes. But the per as, uh, let, me, let me now ask your questions in a slightly, uh, actually, how, how low can I go here? Is it better stop or is it fine? Oh, okay, you don't see. Okay. Um, so, what, what is the final space time? Well, the final space time is, uh, well, let, let, let me go here. Uh, the, final, the final space time is simply that. It's uh, ds squared minus du. Yes, and I, I refer to Wikipedia for Christoffel symbols and Riemann, so I don't write them. Please check uh, this. Check Wikipedia if, or any other book you like. Uh, so the final space time is this, where h final is this final value of the metric, and it's a constant value. It's just a number. Notice that uh, we are working in a linear theory. Uh, you can check as an exercise again that this is a flat space. This is just flat space. And uh, uh, you can make a diffeomorphism, which, which, which looks like that, which will bring the metric into the usual flat space form. Okay. So we can either use um, and uh, basically this, uh, in this simple example, we have uh, the original space and we have a final space, which are both flat space times, but they differ by this diffeomorphism. And uh, you might think, and in many uh, usual texts and uh, treatments of GRs, that two spaces which differ by diffeomorphisms, they should be physically equivalent. And somehow the whole, uh, uh, or 
driving subject or driving repeat, recurring topic in this uh, story is that sometimes it's meaningful to talk about uh, this, uh, this large diffeomorphism such as they're physical. And you should, not, you should be careful when, when, when you talk, even though there is a just flat space and that, uh, the two flat spaces which differ by diffeomorphism, the they can be uh, meaningful. For example, here when we do this, and if we follow the if we follow the detector and we do this transformation on the metric, it will become just the, the original metric of Minkowski space. But as soon as, as we're acting on this uh, on this with this transformation, the detectors on the positions of the detectors they will be not invariant, and in this way we can either detect this change in the length by looking at the metric or equivalent we can make a diffeomorphism. Then the metric is Minkowski, but uh, the, this uh, residual memory is encoded in the positions of the detectors. So uh, this, uh, this large diffeomorphism in the context of uh, the whole uh, Minkowski space will, uh, well, l let me just mention them yet. They will, they will be analogs of, say, something which is called super translations. But here now we are not discussing. We are doing a very simple, very mundane local analysis. Uh, nevertheless, we uh, the sort of main ingredients were slowly emerging. Now, let's ask what is the what is the relation? Um, well, it's yeah, yeah. The, the, why also one thing which, uh, so you might, you might think that electromagnetism is uh, simpler than gravity, and this is one of the instances when that's actually not, because uh, in, uh, as you know, in, uh, in, um, in quantum electrodynamics, uh, gauge transformation, when it acts on the detector, in which part, in, in which, uh, in this case, would be a particle, say, it, uh, it adds to it a phase. And uh, classically, we, uh, phases of particles are not observable, and to observe them, we should do some kind of Aron of Bohm effect. So in QED, the analog of memory is Aron of Bohm effect. That's a dual description of QED. Uh, so H is small, H is small. We, I, I work to first order, and uh, H is a small parameter. And this is Minkowski space. Uh, well, here, yes, but uh, um, he, he, yeah, I, uh, for if H is, uh, yeah, 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 I am, I, yeah, I'm I, sorry, I, here I was working to first order in H, everything so far, we can do, at the, at the end, I will be talking. I will do all the statements precise and full in full nonlinearity. But here, for simplicity, I just uh, work the first order in H. I, I, let me not call it large diffeomorphism here. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, let me. It's confusing. I don't want to call it large diffeomorphism. Yeah. Yeah. All right. At the moment, it's uh, yes. At the moment, this is an assumption, but we will see that uh, that's what happens. That's, I will show that for the sources, which corresponds to the problem of scattering, uh, this is what happens. So, and moreover, you 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 we will see that. Uh, well, that's more or less in, in gravity. That is what happens. That's the only thing that could happen in, in the difference. Um, for example, uh, there are sources uh, which go to zero at the end. So at the moment, it was just an assumption. And now the, uh, the, the simple comment, of course, that if you take, uh, if you want to do a Fourier transform, and uh, you, if you define uh, the, Fourier, the Fourier transform of this, of this wave, um, then uh, this... Uh, uh, 
this residual deformation, this delta H, is encoded in the, in the pole at low frequencies. It's a, again, trivial, sorry, trivial statement, but it will be exactly um, what's, uh, what's happening again and again. So again, it's a, if you take a function of this type, you do a Fourier transform, you will see that this change uh, is encoded in the pole of the, of the function. And you see that uh, uh, in this way, we see that uh, there is a soft theorem and uh, is the soft radiation is related to this large time effects. And uh, uh, when, we, uh, when I will be talking about Minkowski space, of course, it's uh, the full space, it's much complicated. But if we are in observers who are sitting locally, here on Earth, and we have an antenna. That's what we. That's what we see. Now uh, let me move. Uh, start. Start making things more confusing, and uh, to make them more confusing, let me switch to a global picture uh, of uh, space-time. And draw. Uh, so when. Uh, uh, talking about the scattering problem in Minkowski space, it's useful to, because Minkowski space is infinite, it's useful to put it in a, in a finite region. And this is done by means of the so-called conformal compactifications. If we, if, if we want to discuss the causal structure of space-time, um, so we rescale the metric by conformal factor and the known factor is that it doesn't change the, the causal structure and by uh, judiciously choosing conformal factor, we can make infinity at a finite distance. So let me discuss uh, Penrose diagram of Minkowski space. So usually, usually you, the way you see it is the following. Uh, so um, this is, uh, let, me, let me maybe write uh, some useful, some useful coordinates so that, um, um, let me write, here is a metric of Minkowski space. So we have, uh, so we have time, uh, radial direction, which goes from zero to infinity, and an angle on the sphere. And uh, on this diagram, uh, we have uh, the, time, the time goes horizontally. So this has the slices of a constant time. Uh, this is a T constant. This is a constant R. And uh, the, the interesting part is the boundary of this region, which is far, infinitely far away on this diagram. And uh, there are several uh, things which people usually discuss. So they are called I plus. I plus is a future, future time like infinity. That's where a uh, massive particle end. Then there is something which is capital calligraphic I plus which is called scry plus, scry plus. It's a null infinity, that's where light ends. So in the, the great part about, the great thing about Penrose diagrams is that light propagates at 45 degrees. Um, then there is I naught, which is called spatial infinity. And then there is, uh, I minus, which is called scry minus, it's a pass null infinity, and then there is I minus. Um, the, the one thing which you might uh, uh, maybe remember is that, and will be important for us, that even though on this diagram, um, on this diagram, all these three regions. Yes, yeah, sorry, and uh, at every point here, this is a two-dimensional diagram. We have four-dimensional space. So there is a two-sphere hovering everywhere, which denotes uh, the angle on the sphere. So one important uh, fact about this diagram uh, is that even though this uh, null infinities and spatial infinity merge at a point, they actually, this configuration is singular. And uh, when, you, when we will be approaching, if you imagine a 
big barrel or big cylinder in space-time and you start making it large, uh, and then trying to discuss how you approach uh, I plus and I, I minus. Um, I don't know, for example, if you, if you have some observer that send light here or here, um, we will find that this, uh, this uh, when, well, that this uh, null infinities will be actually infinitely far, even though when we will be, uh, e even though they emerge here at a at point, in a sense, in certain situations, it's important to remember, maybe to think about approaching this point as a limit from an observer at fixed time who are going at large distances and send lights to the future and to the past. And then uh, um, we will see that uh, this data, uh, even though on this diagram it can be at the point, it can be actually pretty far. Uh, but sorry, let me maybe not, the moment it's uh, not say more about that. And now uh, the scattering problem corresponds to the something of this type. We have a, uh, what is the scattering problem? Well, we specify the data, something comes, comes in, some particles, or, and then it uh, comes out. And we, uh, we, we given uh, initial data, what, what, uh, what are the waves coming from minus infinity? The, the problem is to find um, the result at uh, scry plus. And uh, now the, to discuss this uh, global structure, yes, and uh, for, for example, let me, uh, I don't know, write what, yeah, I will be scattering just uh, some massless particles, I will be thinking, even though we can scatter massive particles coming from here, so anything, we can scatter everything whatever we like, but for simplicity, we can scatter gravitons, photons, or any massless particle. But now, uh, so I would like to repeat uh, the previous exercise uh, for this. Uh, well, this, uh, this is not, here it's not 45, because here it's not massless. So it is, well, it could, be, it could be a rocket, or it can move on the sphere, so. Sorry, it's, it's maybe it's a, we can draw a better picture. Imagine, let me consider that's what I want to consider now. So we have a point, we have a light cone, so for, for, for this kind of picture, we will just have one line, so I wanted to resolve them sort of on a sphere. And now uh, we can imagine particles coming along null rays. and uh, going in some direction. So they collide at the point and, uh, and then proceed to null infinity. This, to, the, to the leading order, let me describe this process as just a given stress tensor in uh, Einstein equations. And uh, the stress tensor is, uh, say we have, uh, sum of our particles, integral over their proper times, their momenta, their four velocity, and then we have a delta function at the position of the particle, which is, if I see, it's just, so. so this incoming, this is a stress tensor for a set of incoming particles for t equal less than zero. So it is localized at the position of the particle which is given by u mu times tau, it moves in time. And its uh, stress tensor is related to its momentum and for velocity. And then when they collide, uh, we have uh, the same, we have the same kind of uh, sum, but we have a set of final momenta with uh, some other some other choice um, so positive times 
But uh, now we are doing the we are asking the following question: uh, What happens if we well, before we observe the the local um, we observe the local uh, gravity waves? But what happens if we have this uh, gravity wave coming from the event of this type, where particles coming from infinity collide and then they go to infinity again? Well. Uh, to do that, uh, to find uh, what uh, H is, in this case, we simply to need to solve. Um, uh, we simply need to solve the well equations. Uh, equations of motion for the H, and uh, of this type, or indices, and then uh, so we get. We need to, uh, if we have a question of the sort, the uh, h is equal to the integral say, over space time. And here we write a retarded, retarded uh, propagator and the source. So that's what we need to do. So that's how we find the. Uh, the field from a, from a given source. Now, uh, let me uh, write what's uh, a little bit in more details. What's going on? This integral is, of course, very, it's very easy to do. Um, but uh, there is a already Something subtle that will that might happen and unexpected. So let me focus my attention on the detector which sits uh, first of all. So this is the usual coordinates. Let me introduce so-called retarded coordinates, where we can, can, we can use a variable u t equal minus r, and the metric becomes where minus d u square minus two du dr plus r square d omega. So uh, now if we take the limit u fixed and uh, r to infinity, that's a limit where we are approaching this, scri this scri plus. So that's where the light goes. So I would like to compute now the metric in this equation. H is a function of uh, H is a function of u and r, some angle on the sphere. Let me just. Uh, so to do it, recall that. Uh, the retarded, uh, the retarded propagator is this. It's a delta function. Uh, localized along the light cone. So if you have uh, some source, if you have a source, you can draw a light cone. And uh, from the source, and that's where the, uh, the, the green function is uh, localized. So it's very simple to do this integral. It just gives us a delta function. So what we need is actually to compute something like this. We need to compute the integral d tau. Uh, and then we have a delta function of... Uh, of x minus u mu tau square. This is just uh, this delta function. And the, and the four integral here is gone because of this delta function. OK, it's very simple. This, uh, this integral is completely localized. But uh, what's interesting is that let me uh, just write some 
in details. So we have x square minus tau 2xu, that's so for momentum, minus tau squared. Velocity. And now, uh, in these coordinates, if you take this limit, if you take the limit of uh, large, uh, uh, large r and fixed u, uh, we find that this, um, say, x, um, x u becomes a product of r times n u. So it's linear in R, and here N is related to the, it's a four vector related to the direction of observation. So if we have a detector at the position, at uh, some, uh, given by some three vector, unit three vector, then uh, X U goes to R, this N four vector N dot U, and then uh, an X square uh, goes In the large R limit, it's also linear in R. Due to this, due to this piece, it has term R times U. In this way, you can find uh, you can find uh, the tau. You can let me leave it as an exercise. You find the tau. You plug. You solve that this equation should be equal to zero. And then you compute this integral for the sum. And uh, of course, I almost, did, uh, I almost did the computation for you, but the result is that um, the result is uh, very simple that, so h, uh, well, let me actually write immediately the, um, so h will be equal to the, say, theta, h of u, theta of u, uh, sum of a final things, p e final, um, h, a, b, e final, u, final, b, over u, final, times this four vector n, plus delta the theta function of minus u over the initial. And this, uh, uh, this thing is, uh, so there is a jump, it starts with a constant value and it ends in the other value, so there is a change as we discussed before. And this changed is uh, just uh, what is uh, known as a, as a soft factor. So if you take the difference between the two. Um, now, uh, several, several comments in order. First, uh, you see the, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's an important thing. Thank you. That's, that's R. So the, the leading, uh, we're taking R to be large and the metric decays with R. So it decays linearly with R, with this, uh, with this change. Uh, moreover, it's, uh, it's uh, well, now let me do the, the following thing, make the following remarks. First, so first, this, is a, this thing is known uh, as, a, as a soft factor. Uh, 
And it appears also, for example, in the, uh, if you take, uh, maybe let me just postulate it now. I haven't derived it, but you, you will get the same expression if you compute, if you take this prefactor, and you take a limit, soft limit of the amplitude. Oh, we will see it. Where energy of the one of the graviton goes to zero, and it's related again um, to this uh, exercise we did where we, we saw that it's, uh, this re residue is related to the pole in a Fourier transform. And uh, here now we are saying that for this kind of scattering with the source, uh, the source of the pole is uh, controlled by soft limit of the amplitude. Now, uh, another important point in the, uh, this I will use my, I will, I will end on it. It's a very, uh, it's very crucial actually. I would, maybe I would even say that in the, in the original paper by, uh, by Strominger, that was a crucial, crucial insight, which is not completely, well, actually, All right. Yeah, so here I, what, what is A, right? Oh, great. Uh, so let me explain what is meant here. So this is a, this model that we consider with the sources. Of course, it's a model of a scattering amplitude. You consider scattering amplitude with this momenta, pi1, p1, pi. This is the final one. Now, uh, this is uh, what is meant by AN. This is a scattering amplitude with the same momentum as we used for the source. Now, omega is a statement that we consider an uh, amplitude where we attach uh, one more particle, which is a graviton, in this direction uh, of sight with, with this momentum. So it's a graviton attached in the direction where our detector is inserted. And uh, now the, this is an identity, this is a statement that these factors that we found here, which come from the sources, it's actually completely universal. And this change, it is totally insensitive. So here the sources were interacting at a point, but the result for the change, which was in this, we obtained in the simple model, it's completely universal and is insensitive to the, uh, the details of the, uh, of the process, and actually, this would be completely general. That's a, that's, a, that's the meaning of the formula. Yeah, I was I wanted to explain uh, this uh, crucial insight, but maybe I better. I'm out of time. I better start next time. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Any questions?